Assalamu alaikum and a very good morning to you. First and foremost, uh, respected speakers sitting here and distinguished guests in the audience. Um, I was inquiring from her how much allocation of time I have. She has been extremely generous with me because I wanted to spare her the trouble of having to come and stand next to me to remind that your time is up. So she has been generous and offered me five minutes of which I have already lost 30 seconds. I would uh, like to first and foremost begin by making a small plea to each one of you that uh, what I would be offering you here is a point of view of mine that you may want to consider and should you find it worthy enough to think it over. That's all I make a plea. This particular event, thanks to Mr. Ijaz Nassar who organizes it, as I did not coin this word, he said it jovially to me, Sios ka salana urs. So we gather here with a purpose in mind that at the end of it, there would be some recommendations that this group would make to the policy makers with the hope and expectation that it would be read and if found worthy of implementation, it would be implemented. That's the objective. That's the objective of such gatherings. And I'm very hopeful that it has been done in the past, but we have no record available, which I don't know if he has been archiving it in terms of how many decisions were taken, how many were taken it to its ultimate completion. But ladies and gentlemen, you're all CEOs. No one, no single CEO, can claim to know everything about his or her organization. It's next to impossible. You can have a fair idea about everything in the organization, but you can't have the expertise to deal with every situation. So CEO, by the nomination of a board or an authority, actually acquires a de jure position of leadership. So essentially, what does the leader do? The leader realizes that he is afflicted with a lot of inadequacies which need to be plugged in. So he selects or she selects the right constituent to be able to undertake a task and organize these constituents into a harmonious her, individuals or a harmonious entity to arrive at the cherished goal or a corporate objective. That is the role of a CEO or a leader. There are people who acquire de facto leadership by virtue of their expertise and specialization. And I think DGR leaders must recognize their presence in an organization. So if we as CEOs are responsible for A to Z of our companies, respective companies, so also the person who heads the government of the country is the CEO of the country. I think uh, for the last 75 years, we have said enough to them. We have been communicating to them that this is what needs to be done. We are ready to do this. It is time that Mr. Ajaz Nassar, you should have got the CEO of the country to be present here so that we could ask him, you tell us now, what do you want from us? Because we want to take our country back from you. It is when the political system fails to deliver or politicians fails to deliver to their respective countries and societies, the masses begin to resurrect themselves into a formidable force and take back what is rightfully due to them. And this country was a blessed land given to us, carved out of an Indian Union, unthinkable, but it happened. And what did the Qaeda have in his mind? This happens to be the month of March. Is there a willingness on the part of this nation to revive that spirit of the resolution that helped create Pakistan? Until and unless we do a renewal of that process, ladies and gentlemen, we will remain where we are. Please do understand that you and I equally and all segments of the society have willy-nilly or maybe deliberately connived to bring the country to where we are. So who do we blame? 
We can't blame. Stop the blaming process. It's enough. We have had enough of blaming. We all know what our issues are. If we start debating those issues over and over again, they will not resolve by themselves. It requires action. It requires the determination to carry out a will. What did the Qaeda envisage for Pakistan? He envisaged a welfare state, which essentially would indicate to you that maybe he had a socialist bent of mind. No, he was all for free enterprise. Gleaning through his various speeches, statements, interviews that he gave, you can understand that he believes in free enterprise, but he is not averse to state ownership at all. There has to be harmony there. And unfortunately for us, that we lost our Qaed very quickly, while our neighbor had some of the founding fathers leading that country for a good 20 years, and therefore we were able to harmonize this economic systems and thought and take their country to where it is today. So if we have to come out of these shambles, then we'll have to go through some individual inner purification process, each one of us, to decide that we shall deliver. We shall deliver of what the Qaedat envisage. In his first speech to the Constituent Assembly of Pakistan, he referred to corruption. He referred to bribery. He referred to nepotism. He referred to jobbery. What was he foreseeing? What great foresight that individual had. And he was reminding the people to stay away from this. And then he makes a very solemn pledge before those people who are attending that assembly that I shall, for the remaining part of my life as the governor general, I assure you that I shall fight tooth and nail against these ailments of society. And I shall not be influenced in my decision making by any of these aspects of life. How coincidentally, 20 years later, in 1967, two years after the independence of Singapore, Lee Kuan Yew makes a similar statement, very akin to what the Qaeda had said. He said, I want to deliver to the people of Singapore a society where each individual will be able to allow or be allowed to harness his skills and present himself for economic contribution without any distinctions of creed, caste, color, linguistic, or religion. Very similar words. The advantage that Singapore has had over Pakistan is the fact that Lee Kuan Yew lived a very long life and was able to carry through by process of implementing what he had pronounced. What the Qaeda pronounced was never implemented. So consequently, we have a confusion out here in this society. If you were to read the speech that he made, and I think uh, Dr. Rishad Hussain would uh, possibly know better about it. But if you read the speech that he gave at the inauguration of the Central Bank of Pakistan, i.e. the State Bank of Pakistan, you know the Qaeda, Mr. Jinnah actually reminds, okay, the language that he uses is recommendative in nature. He is not imposing his will on the Central Bank. He was very clear that autonomy cannot be challenged. So if you see the way he requested the governor, the then governor of the State Bank of Pakistan, he said, you have a monetary policy tool with you. Please use it very judiciously to ensure that there is economic growth. Was he talking about 2023 in July 1948? Ladies and gentlemen, I invite you to the attention of an interview that he gave again in 1948 to the then very famous Life magazine of USA. And he expressed the challenges that the nascent state of Pakistan then faced. And if you'll read those challenges, you wonder you're reading about 1948 or you're reading about March 2023. He predicted it. And I, I'm very certain in my mind he had solutions to it. Not that he could do it himself, but he knew to pick up the right talent without recommendation or nepotism. We as CEOs therefore have an obligation to our people who work with us that we give them free opportunity to grow without having to receive recommendations for it. Ijaz Nisar sahab ko accuse kiya gaya hai. Accusation is a strong word. But kaha gaya hai ki ye 
ہراس کرتے ہیں اور نیپوٹزم میں انڈلج کرتے ہیں کہ دوسروں سے سفارشیں بھی کرواتے ہیں تو یہ ایک اچھے مقصد کے لیے کر رہے ہوتے ہیں تو میرا اعتقال جائے سے اینڈ دیٹ رومائنس می بیکاز دا جنٹل مین ہو میڈ دیٹ کامنٹ ہیز کنوینئنٹلی واکڈ اوے فرام دا اسٹیج مسٹر جاوید جوار ہی سیڈ دیٹ وی آر ون کنٹری دیٹ ہیز گاٹ دا لارجسٹ بیبی پروڈیوسنگ فیکٹری اینڈ ہی آسٹ اس ٹو شٹ ڈاؤن واٹ از آپریٹنگ ایٹ ہنڈریڈ پرسینٹ دیٹس دا اونلی فیکٹری دیٹس ورکنگ ایٹ فل کیپیسٹی شڈ وی شٹ ایون دیٹ ڈاؤن سو واٹ ول بی لیفٹ آف آس لیڈ دس جنٹل مین پوائنٹ ٹو کنسیڈر اوکے لیٹس گو بیک ٹو دا فنڈامنٹلس ناؤ واٹ آر دا فنڈامنٹلس دا فنڈامنٹلس آر دیٹ وی آر اسپینڈنگ ڈالرس دیٹ وی ہیونٹ ارنڈ وی آر اسپینڈنگ روپیز دیٹ وی ہیونٹ کلیکٹیڈ ایز ریونیو کلیکشن دا گیپ از اونلی وائڈنگ بٹ آور اسپینڈنگ ڈزن اسٹاپ سو کانسیکوینٹلی یو سی دیٹ وی آر شارٹ ان ڈالرس وی آر شارٹ ان روپیز سو دا فزیکل سائڈ از ان continuous decline in terms of collection while we have issues with the foreign exchange already facing us. Can we stop spending the borrowed dollars or use them effectively for increasing our exports? We have no choice in the matter. The battle is one of intellect and ideas today. We need to go back to the drawing board. We need to create an export-oriented economy. We got to earn our dollars. to sustain ourselves in the future. We have so much borrowing that we need to repay in the coming years. Let's earn those dollars. Let's not borrow again to pay for those dollars. Similarly, on the front of local collection of taxes, you and I are responsible for the lack of it. If not all of us, at least some of us will certainly be guilty of having either evaded taxes or have taken comfort from cliche words like tax, tax avoidance or tax efficiency. Let's relook at our national duty and then think in terms of tax efficiencies. I would like to point out uh, a few aspects in relation to the special economic zones, which we have seen other newly industrialized countries of the world have used them to their entire benefit and they have brought an investment into their countries. They have increased the size of the market globally. We have been preparing the blueprint for the longest of times. The nine special economic zones that were designated are dying of neglect, are decaying. We have done nothing about it. And look at China, look at Singapore, look at Malaysia, look at the newly industrialized countries like Thailand included, Taiwan included. Their ex export economic zones are doing so exceedingly well. Uh, it pains me very much, not because of reasons uh, that are economic in nature, but out of sheer sentiment and passion. that even Bangladesh export economic zones are doing exceedingly well. So can we have a revival of that? Can we push our policy makers to start taking decisions to implement? You and I as CEOs, we are framing policies, we are giving ourselves budgets to achieve, and we make sure that we achieve it and our colleagues are driven to achieve it. Why can't the CEO of the country do the same? like Lee Kuan Yew did, like Mahathir did, like Park Chung Hee did. Why can't we? Are we any less intelligent than them? I certainly refuse to accept that. I hope she's not standing next to me here. Okay. I refuse to accept that an ordinary Pakistani is less intelligent than anybody in the neighborhood that we have. We are as bright as anybody. It's all a question of directing the energies into productive sectors. We have a youth bulge, but what are we doing about it? leading them to decadence by not providing them enough opportunities economically growing. Parents have abandoned their duty to speak to their offsprings. That's a major social malaise and a dilemma that society faces today. Children are scared of their parents. Any child who is scared of the parents will be extremely scared of the world out there. Let's re-engage. Let's build up those lines of communication between our own family units. and resurrect ourselves to where we began with that spirit and enthusiasm that we thought we all had to build a great country. We have the wherewithal, but we keep talking about the wherewithal. We do not talk about the output. It is time we get to take custody back of our country from those who are holding it away from us. It belongs to us and we must take it back. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen.